So interestingly, this chapter has documentaries, but then also has experimental film. Experimental film is weird. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you, it's just weird. It's usually not narrative. It doesn't usually have a story. There's not a beginning, middle, end. There's not a three act structure. There's not a hero's journey. Okay, the stuff that we've been kind of talking about all semester. Experimental film, though, is important because like so many artists or engineers or inventors, they are taking risks and doing work that pushes boundaries. It explores um, what happens when you think beyond the parameters of what is the norm and they make discoveries. So it's important from that perspective. It's not necessarily what you're gonna sit down to watch uh, just with a bucket of popcorn and a soda and just to you know chill and relax. So an experimental film is very often going to be completely sensory. It's about what things look like, what things sound like, and perhaps those things are evoking a response. They're, revo they're evoking um, an intellectual or emotional response, but it's not because of story. It is simply because of the sensory input. You have these surreal images that have been created and uh, pieces that are connected together with no real necessarily seeming obvious bridge. There may be a bridge creatively in the filmmaker's mind, but it's not necessarily going to be a bridge that's obvious to you. Often order and control and reason are missing from these films. Um, there's a group called the New American Cinema Group who worked to um, work improvisationally they did have mise-en-scene uh, in their work, but it was mostly what they found on the street or found. That's how they created their scenes rather than building a set and addressing them with a whole lot of improv. Experimental film is another area where women have historically been able to um, have the freedom to experiment and take risks Again, these aren't movies that have to make money. And so historically we know that in uh, Hollywood specifically, but in the film world, when money's on the table, women have been excluded. Uh, in experimental film, money is really not on the table. So uh, again, it's a place where women have had the freedom to work and experiment and create art, like something that is artistic, for the sake of being artistic, like a, a strange cubist painting or something like that, where it's you're not really supposed to make sense of it. You bring yourself to the experimental film and you take from it what your own story and your own character pulls from it. You are able to interpret somewhat an experimental film, which is a lot of fun. I've given you in the PowerPoint two links to a, probably the most famous experimental film. This is earlier in the 20th century. It's called Imak Bakia. It was uh, a silent film and it's one of the very earliest. It has had a soundtrack added to it now, but it was not originally presented with a soundtrack. The images are quite unsettling as is the soundtrack. In fact, to be honest, I can really only endure about 10 minutes of this film before my nerves start to actually struggle. And a lot of that is it's just the images and the music are so strange and so unsettling. I have, uh, but, but I have gotten all the way through it, but only by sheer like dint of will. So if you only watch maybe 10 or so minutes of it, just to get a feel of how strange experimental film really can be, more power to you. But if you think it's phenomenal and you are so interested in what's happening, watch the whole thing. But it is very strange and it's very disconnected and it, it doesn't seem to have a narrative. It doesn't have a narrative, um, but it is 
interesting, interesting to look at, some very strange stuff. Okay, and then finally in our chapter, we talk about animation. Now, I know I've put on my Disney ears, my Minnie Mouse ears. Animation is bigger than Disney, but in my mind, it still all kind of comes back to Disney. So uh, we're gonna talk about Disney among other things. Animation starts in 1824. That's a, that's a while back, that's a couple of hundred years back. Um, there was a scientist who discovered something called the persistence of vision. This is that phenomenon where when you see something, the memory of that something stays in your mind for one-tenth of a second so that by the next time you see something, they've melted together. That is the entire basis for how animation works because really an animated film, a traditionally hand-drawn animated or claymation animated film, they are made up of thousands of individual photos that by the time your mind has processed them, they meld together because of this phenomenon called persistence of vision so that things just flow, even though they're actually individual um, photos, photos of individual drawings. Um, so that's in 1824 that that was discovered and, and documented as a scientific fact. And then in 1828, they invent uh, th something called a thaumatrope. And that's essentially two drawings. It's a back and a front which if you spin them because of persistence of vision, your mind blends the two things together. So I've got a clip of one on the, that is a bird on one side and a cage on the other side. And when you spin them, the bird and the cage blend together. And so it looks like one photo when really it's two. So that is then the next step in the development of animation. So in the, early 1900s, while silent films are um, happening, we also have the earliest animation happening. Windsor McKay in the 1910s creates, he figures this out and he creates with film that he can draw and then draw and then draw and then draw and photo and photo and photo and photo and then crank it through the film projector and it starts to look like one continuous fluid story. I have a link to one for you. Uh, it's got this clown and alligator and all these strange things, but he's kind of the beginning of where uh, animated film begins. The thing with animated film, and, and you see this even now, I'm watching Moana a lot right now because my uh, 16 month old granddaughter, this is her movie her movie. She loves it. Um, if she hears Moana singing from wherever she is in the house, she immediately drops whatever she's doing, doing and tiptoes into the living room, sits down on her TV pillow, and is in rapture for the rest of the time. So lots of Moana going on at my house right now. When I watch Moana, I am stunned repeatedly, after many viewings still, by the sheer beauty of the animation, the saturated colors and um, the water, which looks now photorealistic. I mean, it is, it is really beautiful. Part of loving animation is loving the actual art and miraculous creation of animation itself. It's one of the things that animation has banked on all of these years going all the way back to Windsor McKay, when the early film audiences are watching it on the screen and they're just amazed by watching this clown with the cigar um, drawing, moving, and that goes all the way through every iteration of animation to where now just the artistic merit of animation itself the beauty of what the artists create with their artist mind and skill and um, hands and what they can do now with the computer, that is part of the appeal of animation itself. Um, Walt Disney comes along and 
he of course, he works as did Windsor McKay uh, with individual drawings. This is where we get Steamboat Willie, which is the very earliest Mickey Mouse uh, cartoon. Walt actually started with a character called Oswald the Lucky Rabbit um, and then moves on from Oswald to Mickey and Mickey is where the success really happens with Steamboat Willie. But they're drawn, they're black and white, they're hand drawn, it's photo, 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 spin, 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 spin. Then Disney and his team invent something called the multiplane camera. And this was the next big leap forward in animated technology. And I've got a clip in there for you where Disney explains it. And I've seen a model of, of this camera at Disney World, but essentially you've got the painting and then you've got all these cameras stacked and it, it catches, the camera's able to move in and out so that, and the, the pictures are stacked in layers so that you are able to get, um, with these layered pictures, these layered paintings and this camera, you're able to sort of get a sense of depth so that everything doesn't look flat and one dimensional. You start to see movement that can happen that looks more like what's happening in real nature. The invention of the multiplane camera utterly changed the way animation worked, especially when you're talking about full length animation like Snow White or Pinocchio. Not necessarily the short cartoons that are five minutes long, but those really long, really artistic ones. The multiplane camera changes everything. On, you've got Disney on one hand. On the other hand, it is worth talking about um, Warner Brothers and the Looney Tunes because they are sort of the flip side of Disney. Disney has always and ever been, I think, a sweeter company in the sense of what they create. Disney stories are driven by magic, the belief of wishes coming true, true love being found, heroism. Looney Tunes are created for the sheer joy of laughter and anarchy. So you get Bugs Bunny and uh, Elmer Fudd, or you get the Roadrunner and the Coyote. Warner Brothers look more slapstick because they are. They're based on old vaudeville slapstick bits, and the animation is as high in quality as anything you would ever get from a Disney cartoon. The writing, the music, all of the quality is there, but the approach is very, very different, and it's very silly and very fun, uh, and lots of anvils falling on roadrunners and things like that. Very important work, though. So when you would go to see a silent film, and then on up even later, you would go to see a movie. Before the movie, you got cartoons. And you might get Disney, you might get Steamboat Willie, but you might also get Bugs Bunny. So um, those things ha happened where we have now the movie previews, the, the trailers, they used to have cartoons and um, newsreels. So everyone was watching cartoons when they went to see movies. It wasn't just a thing for small children. It was for everyone back in the 20s, 30s, and into the 40s. Um, and then when I was a kid, all of these cartoons moved into syndication. And so I've, I've probably talked about this before. I only had like four TV stations that even existed when I was a kid. We had ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, and usually one local affiliate. And uh, that local affiliate was running in the afternoons when we got home from school, uh, Looney Tunes and Mickey Mouse Club and goofy cartoons, all of those things were happening in the afternoons after school on the local affiliate station, and then um, maybe on Saturday mornings. So my generation grew up with cartoons in a completely different way. I dare say probably your generation, um, you guys have been watching animation since you were toddlers with the advent of the VHS, especially 
that meant that your parents could pop in a VHS of Little Mermaid or pop in a VHS of, I don't know, Cars or I don't know what was going in the late 90s, Beauty and the Beast and all those guys. You guys had grown up with, anima with animation in a, an even more saturated way than my generation did. Animation has probably, it's probably the first thing you ever actually watched on a screen. And most likely it was probably, it was probably Disney that you started with when you were itty bitty, teeny weeny little kiddos. And then we move into computer animation. We go from hand-drawn to computer. Um, the advent of computer animation, of course it starts back in the 80s. They say that Tron is one of the, the first, there's discussion and disagreement over Tron is actually the first. Um, Jurassic Park is the first film to use computer animation to make photorealistic uh, creatures in a full length feature film in the massive way that Jurassic Park did. Um, with Jurassic Park, I remember going to see it, I think it was like 1992, 93, in a theater in, in Weatherford, Texas. And I remember that moment, you see it with Laura Dern when she stands up in the Jeep and she's just just completely bowled over. And then they show these brontosauri and they're enormous. And I remember sitting in the theater just thinking, everything just changed. Everything has changed with computers being able to do animation of this style. Everything is gonna shift in animated filmmaking and in regular filmmaking. And of course it has, I was no big Profit. that was obvious to everyone. It's just that I remember. I remember how big and how significant that moment felt when it happened. So of course, then the next, to me, the next big step on that is Toy Story and going to see Toy Story just a couple of years later and we get the fully animated look of Toy Story. And again, just knowing at that moment that animation was changing when you look back at the original Toy Story now, it looks primitive almost compared to what Toy Story 4 looks like, the fluidity and the shading um, and the facial expressions that they're able to do now. But of course you have to have the, the steps, you know, and, and those of us that were watching Toy Story when it came out uh, as children or as adults, that looked state of the art technology to us then Whereas, you know, today's kids look at Toy Story 4 and that to them is state of the art. And in 20 more years, there'll be a whole nother level of, of the state of the art. So um, that's animation.